بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم من الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters and friends and welcome to my new YouTube channel and this first video الحمد لله all perfect praise and gratitude ultimate gratitude belong to the Lord of everything that exists brothers and sisters I wanted to start this YouTube channel with this first video on the topic of sincerity the sincere intention ikhlas and this is such a weighty and profound and important topic because as you know any of our acts of ibadah any of our acts of worship are only accepted if we have sincere intention and that those actions are in line with the sunnah with the way of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and ikhlas in this context sincerity in this context is doing this act of worship for Allah alone and we're going to unpack what that really means in a few moments and this is such an important topic brothers and sisters and it is unfortunate from my limited perspective I don't know everything that happens online but from my limited perspective I have come to the conclusion the unfortunate conclusion that we don't unpack this topic enough to the degree that we facilitate people's journey so they can become a mukhlis they could become a sincere worshiper and we don't emphasize on this topic enough think about it brothers and sisters we can do great da'wah call people to allah with hikmah and rahma with wisdom and compassion we can facilitate nations to become muslim we can facilitate the alleviation of poverty and so many beautiful things which which are acts of ibadah they're acts of worship and if we don't have within those actions ikhlas sincerity doing it for allah alone then they're going to be meaningless we're not going to have any reward on the day of judgment they're going to carry no weight whatsoever and that's why it's extremely important brothers and sisters especially in our kind of narcissistic age right social media we want retweets and comments and likes and subscribers and fame and so on and so forth it is so important that we emphasize this topic even more because when we understand this topic as it should be understood then a lot what happens online wouldn't happen we won't be petty anymore we won't squabble and argue we will have a sense of true manliness because true manliness in our tradition is obviously emulating the best man to have walked this planet which is the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who is the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and emulating in what sense emulating from the point of emulating his external manliness and internal manliness because sometimes what we do we just focus on the external how i look am i assertive can i articulate myself can i win an argument am i strong and so on and so forth but the hardest and the most difficult struggle if you like is to actually emulate the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam from an internal perspective to have, to have that internal manliness which includes what includes compassion includes hilm forbearance repelling by that which is better responding to evil responding to anything with what is more beautiful and what is more virtuous that is very difficult holding down your ego swallowing your pride these are important internal traits that we have to have which are traits of manliness and if we are sincere we're more likely to have those traits if we have ikhlas we're more likely to have those traits because we will have an allah centric and akhira centric mindset a god centric mindset and we transcend these petty issues we'll have a lofty vision for ourselves and so on and so forth and it's extremely important we revive this topic of ikhlas so especially when it comes to a believer's point of view that we have this external and internal true manliness right and the reason i'm focusing on this because there's a lot of discussion on this topic online and unfortunately the internal manliness which is the most difficult struggle is not really highlighted and we have this kind of shallow approach of what it means to be a muslim male a muslim man that we're assertive we look good we're powerful we're strong we can articulate ourselves we can win a debate but with all due respect this is just one part of it there's a massive lacuna a massive gap in the discourse 
generally speaking, I know some people are talking about this, but the massive gap is what about the internal traits? And when we see this pettiness online, we see grown men having childish debates. We have grown men excessively defending themselves. We have grown men who basically act like children with all due respect and very vulnerable. And they misuse their external power, which is really a veil for an internal pathology. Then this is a sign of an indicator of not having a true understanding of ikhlas and not having an Allah-centric and akhira-centric focus, which will unpack in a few moments. And that's very important to add. Now, by the way, you may be thinking, why am I focusing on, on manliness? Well, it is a very important topic for sure. But these traits, of course, have to be internalized by our sisters as well, from their own context, that they have the kind of internal akhlaq, the internal tarbiyah for sure. But I wanted to focus on this because the majority of people on YouTube are actually males and the kind of manliness discourse is highlighted and, and focused on in recent times. So I thought I want to connect it from that point of view. Anyway, brothers and sisters, so we're going to be talking about ikhlas, one of the most important topics. And the first thing I want to talk about is a very famous and well-known hadith, prophetic tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this was narrated by Muslim. It's an authentic hadith. And I'm going to read this hadith out to you so you understand the gravity of what we're talking about here. So Abu Huraira, radiallahu an, may Allah be pleased with him, reported that he heard the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, say, The first to be judged on the day of judgment is a man who was martyred. He will be brought and Allah will remind him of his favor upon him, which he will recognize. Allah will say, what did you do as a token of gratitude for that favor? He will say, I fought for your sake until I was martyred. Allah will say, you have lied. You fought, so it would be said that you were brave. And it was said. It will be commanded that he will be dragged on his face into his throne into the fire. A man who acquired knowledge, taught it and recited the Quran, he will be brought and Allah will remind him of his favor upon him, which he will recognize. Allah will say, what did you do as a token of gratitude for that favor? He will say, I acquired knowledge and taught it and I recited the Quran for your sake. Allah will say, you have lied. You learned so it would be said that you were a scholar and you recited the Quran so it would be said that you were a reciter. And that was said. It will be commanded that he will be dragged on his face into his throne in the fire. A man for whom Allah expanded his resources and gave him from all types of wealth, he will be brought and Allah will remind him of his favor upon him, which he will recognize. Allah will say, what did you do as a token of gratitude for that favor? He will say, I left no path wherein you love to spend except that I spent therein for your sake. Allah will say, you have lied. You did so. You did that so it would be said that you were generous and that was said. It would be commanded that he would be dragged on his face into his throne in the fire. Brothers and sisters and friends, it is so important based on this hadith and many other ayat, verses in the Quran and ahadith, prophetic traditions that we're going to be talking about today. It is so important for us to understand that when it comes to our acts of worship, we have to do them solely for the sake of Allah, to have ikhlas. And we have to understand what that actually means. Because sometimes we say, yes, I'm doing it for the sake of Allah. But if I were to ask you, what does that actually mean? How do you unpack that? How do you develop that? You may not have an answer. And that's why it's so important for us to have this discussion today, inshallah. And it's so important for us to emphasize on this topic. And scholars of the past have actually argued that they wished that there was a group of scholars that only focused on the sincere intention. For example, Ibn Abi Jamrah said, I had hoped that among the scholars, among the scholars, there would be some who would have no other occupation but to teach people about the intentions behind their actions. And that they would be completely free to sit and teach only the dynamics of intention and its details. Because many people fail 
only because they go astray in that regard. So let's focus on intention, brothers and sisters and friends. So in the Islamic tradition, there are two main areas or two main meanings concerning intention, niyyah, okay? Now, it's very important to understand that the first meaning we're not going to be talking about because this has a kind of legal domain and it focuses on what you are intending, not the quality of the intention, but what you are intending. And this is in the realm of fiqh, of Islamic jurisprudence, and it focuses on determining the action itself. And we're not discussing this very nuanced legalistic aspect of intention. We're going to be talking about the other meaning of niya, the other meaning of intention, which refers to the sincere intention, which is really the domain of knowledge or the category of knowledge concerning ikhlas, sincerity. And this type of intention or this meaning of intention really defines as quality or purity. It focuses on whom the action is for. And this is why it's very important for us to focus and zoom in on this discussion. And this was the concern of the pious predecessors, the concern of the early generations. So ikhlas, sincerity, from the perspective of intention, a sincere intention, focuses on determining for whom the action is and why it is ultimately done. Okay, so these are two important points for you to understand. So when we're talking about niyyah, we're talking about ikhlas, we're talking about the sincere intention, we're focusing on these two areas. Number one, for whom the action is for and why it is ultimately done. So what is ikhlas? What is sincerity? Now, obviously, ikhlas in the English language means sincerity. From an Arabic perspective, from the classical Arabic tradition, the word ikhlas comes from the triliteral stem, kha, lam, sad. Okay? And if you go to the classical dictionaries, you will have the following meanings associated with this root. Purity, to be unblemished, to purify, to extricate, to extract, to select above others, to, be, to befriend, to bring to safety, to reach safety, to arrive, to join someone, to be alone, to be sincere. Now, interestingly, of this root, nine forms are mentioned or occur in the Qur'an 31 times. And let's focus now the Qur'anic usage of this word in some of the relevant verses and understand, and we start to understand what ikhlas actually means from a Qur'anic perspective. So one of the forms is akhlasa, akhlasa, okay, which means to devote, to dedicate oneself, or something entirely to. And we see this Qur'anic context in chapter 4, verse 146, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Not so those who repent, mend their ways, hold fast to Allah, hold fast to God, and devote the religion entirely to Him. Okay? So here, ikhlas means a sense of devotion, sincere devotion to Allah. That the religion is for Allah, meaning that the acts of worship, the acts of ibadah are for Allah alone. Another Quranic context is when Allah mentions the word khalis, khalis. And this means pure, complete, total and true. And we see this in chapter 39 verse 3 when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, True complete devotion is due to Allah alone. True complete devotion is is due to God alone. Another usage of this form, of this root that we mentioned, is the word mukhlis, mukhlis. And this really means the one who devotes themselves, or one who dedicates oneself to something. And it can also mean the one who is sincere. So from the perspective of the one who devotes or dedicates oneself to something, we find this in the Quranic verse, uh, Chapter 39 verse 2, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, we have sent down the book to you with truth, to worship Allah, to worship God, devoting to Him the religion. Okay, a sense of devotion, a sense of directing acts of worship to Allah alone. Also from the context of mukhlis, meaning one who is sincere, this can be found in Surah Al-Baqarah, the second chapter of the Quran, verse 139, when Allah says, say to the people of the scripture, how can you argue with us about Allah 
when he is our Lord and your Lord. Our deeds belong to us and yours to you. We are sincere to him. So we get a, a sense now. We get a kind of Quranic picture that ikhlas really means that you dedicate yourself to Allah. That your religion is for Allah, meaning that your acts of worship, that your devotion is to Allah's religion, which includes all the acts of worship, that they are singled out, singled out and directed to Allah alone and for Allah alone. And this echoes what the scholars have said. For example, Sahel al-Tustari said, those possess possessing intelligence looked into the explanation of ikhlas and did not find anything better than this. And he says that a person's activity and non-activity in private and public be for Allah alone. Nothing or no one is mixed within it, no ego, no desire, no worldly matter. The scholar uh, uh, Al-Jurjani said, Al-Ikhlas, sincerity, is not to seek with your actions a witness other than Allah. Another scholar said, Ikhlas means to single, single out Allah with intent for obedience. And this is very interesting because the scholar Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad said, Abandoning action for the sake of people is to seek their admiration. To do an action for the sake of people is to commit, commit shirk, associationism. In other words, to associate partners in the worship of Allah. Indeed, ikhlas is when Allah saves you from both of these states. Allah saves you from both of these states, which essentially means that you're doing this particular act of worship, not for praise, not for pleasure. You're doing it for Allah alone. So we're, get a, we're getting a general picture here of what ikhlas is, is to do an act of worship for Allah, to direct this act of worship, to single out this act of worship for Allah alone. But what does that mean? Let's unpack it further. What does that actually mean? Fine, I know I do it for Allah's sake, but what does that mean? Now the scholars have discussed three aspects concerning ikhlas. Number one, that you do the act of worship because Allah is worthy of it and that you love Allah. Okay, this is very important. Number two, that you're doing the action to seek his divine reward. Number three, that you're doing it to protect yourself from his divine punishment. Now the scholars say, if you do it for any one of these reasons, it means you have ikhlas. But the scholars also argue that if you can, you do it for all of these reasons. And it may be the case that one reason is more emphasized than the others, or one aspect is more emphasized than the others. But generally speaking, if we want to traverse the path of being a mukhlis, being a sincere, devoted worshipper, then what we should do is try to do it for all of these three reasons, inshallah. And the Quran and the Sunnah indicate exactly what we're talking about concerning ikhlas and devoting ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are many verses, so I'll just mention a few. For example, in chapter 98, verse 5, Allah says in the Qur'an, And they were not commanded except to worship Allah, being sincere to Him in religion, inclining to truth, and to establish prayer and zakah. And that is the correct religion. Allah says in chapter 6, verses 162 to 163, Say, indeed, my prayer, my rites of sacrifice, my living and my dying are for Allah, Lord of the worlds. No partner has he, and this I have been commanded, I, and I am the first of the Muslims. Also in chapter 39 verse 11, Allah says, Say, indeed I have been commanded to worship Allah, being sincere to him in religion. And chapter 40 verse 14, Allah says, So invoke Allah, being sincere to him in religion, although the disbelievers dislike it. And the sunnah is replete with Statements concerning ikhlas and sincerity and the sincere intention. And I'm just going to mention a few. This hadith, this prophetic tradition is narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. It's an authentic hadith. That the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The deeds are considered by the intentions. Actions are considered by the intention. The intentions. And a person will get the reward according to his intention. So whoever emigrated for Allah and his messenger, 
his emigration would be for Allah and his messenger. And whoever emigrated for worldly benefits or for a woman to marry, his emigration would be for that what he emigrated for. In an authentic hadith narrated by An Nasai, the Prophet وسلم, was asked by a man, What do you think about a person who joins us in the fighting only to seek fame and wealth? So Allah's Messenger وسلم, replied, He receives nothing. The man repeated the question three times. Each time Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, He receives nothing. Then he said, Indeed, Allah does not accept an action except if it is khalis, purely for Allah's sake, seeking nothing but his face. Also, a hadith narrated by Muslim, an authentic hadith, Abu Huraira radiallahu and said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah, may he be blessed and exalted, says, I am so self-sufficient that I am in no need of having an associate. Thus he who does an action for someone else's sake as well as mine will have the action renounced by me to him who he has associated with me. So brothers and sisters, we see from the Quran and the Sunnah, from a linguistic perspective, from a scholastic perspective, we see that we have to take this topic of ikhlas extremely seriously and we have to understand that no matter what we do and how great our actions are, they are not going to be accepted unless we fix what's in our heart because the niyyah, the intention, ikhlas is in our hearts. It's not in our brains or in our liver or in our muscles. It's in our hearts. And this is one of the greatest struggles, brothers and sisters. And you see scholars of the past, they actually found this extremely problematic to the point where it affected their physical well-being. So how do we start to develop this understanding of the importance of ikhlas? And how do we start to be encouraged to become people of ikhlas? And how do we start to facilitate our internal and external environment so we could be a mukhlis, we could be someone of sincere devotion to Allah. One way of doing it is to understand the consequences of having ikhlas, of having sincerity, and the consequences of being insincere, of not having ikhlas. So let's focus on the consequences of having ikhlas. Number one, you will go to Jannah. SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters, that's it. That's the only consequence you really need to understand. You will have eternal bliss in paradise with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This world, this dunya, brothers and sisters, is a limited world. We may live, what, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, but the akhirah, the hereafter, is an eternity. Now, even if you think, it from, think about it from a mathematical perspective, think about infinity, right? Take a life of 70 years. How can you compare 70 years to an infinity? 70 uh, infinity minus 70 is still infinity. That's how great the eternal abode is. So from that perspective, brothers and sisters, we have to take this extremely seriously. And if you have ikhlas, if you have sincerity, you are eligible for eternal bliss with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a great encouragement. Another consequence of having ikhlas is that your sincere intention is far-reaching. In other words, if you have sincere intention, it outstrips an action. Now, Yahya ibn Abi Kathir said, Learn about intention, for it is more far-reaching than actions. What does this mean? For example, if I intend to share Islam academically and intellectually with the whole world, okay, and I intend my whole life is based upon this, and I die tomorrow, inshallah, I will get the reward of my intention. So I may have not achieved what I intended, but because I have sincere intention doing it for the sake of Allah, I will get rewarded from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So your intention far outstrips, outstrips a particular action. Another consequence of having ikhlas is that it makes small actions great. Ibn al-Mubarak said, maybe a small action is made great by its intention and maybe a great action is made small by its intention. Now think about it brothers and sisters. If, for example, you drink water, and this is a natural act, it's not an act of worship, it's a natural act, it's a necessity. And people drink water all the time, and we do it kind of almost without even thinking about it. It's a natural act, it's part of life, we have to maintain ourselves, we have to have water. 
you can make this small action into a great one. How? By just changing your intention. You could just stop, pause and reflect and say, Ya Allah, I know I need this water, but I am in need of you most. I am ultimately dependent upon you. And these things are just means. These things are just means and they're just kind of secondary causes. And I understand that everything is dependent upon your irada and qudra. Everything is dependent upon your will and power. And if you wanted, if I could drink this water and I would never quench my thirst. If it was in line with your will and your your what, what you want, right? So you understand that you have ultimate dependence on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you say to Allah, Oh Allah, I am drinking this water, yes, because I need the water to sustain myself. But I, now I'm changing my intention, I'm enhancing my intention. I am drinking this water, Ya Allah, because I want to stay fit and healthy, because I want to increase my ibadah, I want to increase my worship of you. I want to love you more, I want to obey you more, and so on and so forth. And if you change your intention by just having some water, brothers and sisters, every time you drink water, it will be an act of worship. So before that intention, it's something that you need to do and you need to survive and you're a human being. It's a natural need. But if you reframe it, like the way, I, the way I've, I've tried to explain, that, we, that you should understand that we are ultimately dependent on Allah, on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not dependent on this water. We're dependent on Allah. These things are just asbab causes Allah uses to manifest his irada and qudra, his will and power and his authority. And and once we understand that and we change our intention to say that I'm drinking this, yes, because it's one of the things that I require to stay alive, that you have made as a means, Ya Allah. However, I'm going to drink this water so I could be strong and healthy in order to worship you more. Allahu Akbar. Such a small mundane action is elevated to an act of worship. And this links to the next point, that habitual or daily mundane actions, actions can be rewarded. For example, the Prophet ﷺ said, And know that whatever you spend seeking Allah's countenance with it, you will get reward for it even for the morsel of food which you put in your wife's mouth. And this was narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. This is an authentic tradition. So if you feed your wife with your own hand and you put a morsel of food in your wife's mouth, doing it for Allah's pleasure, then that action itself could be an act of worship. Similarly, there may be sisters who are homemakers, alhamdulillah, the greatest job a Muslim woman can do to be a mother and to be a wife. This is the kind of priority of values in our tradition. Yes, a woman can work and we need doctors and engineers for sure. But we need to kind of reclaim the narrative and actually talk about what Allah prioritizes and what Islam prioritizes. In the grand cosmic scheme of things, the greatest role, the definition of what it means to be a queen, if you like, is that a woman is a mother and a wife. This is the best thing that she can do. Obviously, we do need other functions in society and women have an important role in civil society in the Islamic uh, governance and the Islamic environment, for sure. And they have to be doctors and so on and so forth and nurses and teachers. But at the end of the day, from a moral priority, values priority, the hierarchy of values, the best thing a woman can do is that she is a mother and a wife. We need to reclaim this narrative and there is no shame in this. And we need our influencers and our du'at and our mashayikh and all of these people to start promoting the correct hierarchy of values from the Islamic perspective because they come from Allah, the one who has the picture and we just have the pixel, the one who is al-alim, al-hakim, the one who is knowing and the one who is wise. The point is, if a woman who is a homemaker, she's making her husband's favorite dish, which is say it's a fish and she hates fish. She doesn't like the taste. She doesn't like the smell. Now, she can basically just get upset about it and she's making this fish. She loves her husband for sure, but it's just troublesome, right? If she changes her intention and basically says, Ya Allah, I am cooking this smelly food that I don't like, this food that I don't like the taste of or the smell of, I'm doing it for your pleasure. I'm doing it for your sake alone. Every time you do it now, every time you cook that food, for example, it's going to just change the paradigm, the spiritual paradigm, because you will get rewarded. It will be an act of worship. And over time, when you do it and you have that intention, it's going to be something that you're going to fall in love with. 
And this can include feeding your wife. It can include when a wife is, is cooking some smelly food that she doesn't like the taste of or the smell of. It could be any action. Those actions, if you just reframe it and you just change your intention for the sake of Allah, over time, not only will you fall in love with it, but you also get the reward. And that's the power of intention. Habitual, daily, mundane actions or actions you don't like can be rewarded immensely. And this is interesting because you have the scholar Zaid Ashami. He said, Verily, I like that I have an intention for everything, even if even if it be eating and drinking. Just like going to the gym, brothers. If you go to the gym and you want to get strong and fit, and you know, you're doing it because it's the thing that you like to do, you could change the intention. And every time you go to the gym, it could be an act of worship. Because you could be like, Oh Allah, the Prophet wasallam said that Allah, that you love the strong believer rather than the weak believer. And yes, this means spiritually, but it also means physically. And I want to be strong physically to show that Muslims are healthy and that Islam changes your external physical and internal appearance and internal reality that we're holistic human beings and that i kind of come across as assertive and confident and also that i could be strong to defend my family and that i could be strong to continue to do ibadah and acts of worship for you so i could pray in the last third of the night for long periods of time i want to be fit and healthy and the gym is going to facilitate that so every time you go to the gym it will be an act of worship allahu akbar Another consequence of having ikhlas is that you get rewarded even if you're mistaken. Also, another consequence is that it grants you wisdom. Now, why is it the case? Why is it the case that having ikhlas, having sincerity, is that you're granted wisdom? Well, it's very simple. If you have ikhlas, it means you're doing an act, an act of worship for Allah alone. Which means that you're going to be asking a particular question. What does Allah want from me in this particular context? Right? Because if you're truly akhirah centric Allah-centric, you have this ikhlas, this sincerity to please Allah, to gain His divine reward, to shield yourself away from the punishment. If you have that in your mind, you're going to be asking this question every time you do something. What does Allah really want from me in this context? Once you ask that question, you would apply the ilm, the knowledge that you have, or the knowledge that you acquire from other people, and you apply it in your context. You make it relevant. And that's the definition of wisdom. Is making knowledge relevant. Is taking your ilm and applying it in a context. And we see this in the Quran. I believe in Surah Yusuf. When Allah says, And we taught him wise judgment and ilm. And this is how we reward the doers of good. So Allah is making a distinction between wise judgment and knowledge. Because hikmah, wisdom or wise judgment is the application of knowledge. So Allah will grant you wisdom. Also, you get Allah's support. There is an authentic hadith narrated by an, uh, an Nasai where the Prophet wasallam said, Verily, Allah only supports this nation due to the support of the vulnerable and the poor and due to their supplications, their prayers and their sincerity. Sincerity is a key to unlock the door to Allah's support. This is so important. Also, Another consequence of having ikhlas is protection from shayateen. Another consequence of having ikhlas is Allah will take care of you. Allah will take care of you. Umar ibn al-Khattab, he wrote to Abu Musa, may Allah be pleased with them both, and he said, whoever purifies his intention, Allah will take care of his affairs between people. Whoever embellishes for people what Allah knows is not in his heart, Allah Almighty would disgrace him. And this is very important. So one of the greatest companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Umar ibn al Khattab radiallahu an, is saying that if you purify you purify your intention, Allah will take care of your affairs. Also, another consequence of having ikhlas, brothers and sisters, is the removal of negative spiritual whisperings, waswasa. Suleiman al Darani he said, if a person has ikhlas, if a person has sincerity. Much of waswasa, much of the negative spiritual whisperings and riya and ostentation will leave him. Finally, brothers and sisters, the consequences of having ikhlas is that you gain reward even if the action is not performed, just like what I mentioned earlier. Meaning that sincere intention is far-reaching, it outstrips an action. And we see this in a hadith, in a prophetic tradition of the Prophet ﷺ, narrated by Muslim. 
where the Prophet wasallam said, whoever asked for shahada truly out of his heart, Allah will, will take him to the levels of martyrs even if he died on his bed. Allahu Akbar. This should motivate us brothers and sisters, everything we mentioned thus far should motivate us to take the the topic of ikhlas extremely seriously and to try to internalize it in our hearts and that we have people around us that facilitate a life of ikhlas. That they remind us that they're good companions, that they remind us that you need to have sincere intention. And that we also hold our own selves to account because at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, the most important thing is having ikhlas because all of the great actions that we do online and offline are never going to be accepted unless it's for the sake of Allah. So again, Let's continue this journey. Now, what are the consequences of not having ikhlas? Number one, jahannam. Brothers and sisters, wallahi, this is the most serious thing. Anyone who is sincere, anyone who is has any aspect of insinir, humanity in the heart, rahma, mercy, they would not wish jahannam on anybody. The Prophet wasallam said, and this hadith is narrated by Abu Dawood, he said, whoever acquires religious knowledge, which is normally acquired to gain the pleasure of Allah, for the sole reason to secure worldly comforts, will not even smell the fragrance of paradise on the day of resurrection. In other words, he will not enter paradise. Brothers and sisters, why risk your akhirah? Why risk the eternal abode in the hereafter, which is eternity? Why risk that? By doing acts of worship for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if you don't do acts of worship for the sake of Allah, these acts of worship will have no meaning. They'll be meaningless. They would have no reward. They will have no weight. And this is extremely important, brothers and sisters, for us to take extremely seriously. So the consequences of not having a class is that we go to Jahannam. We are eligible for Jahannam. The other consequence which is related is that we lose reward of actions. We could do great actions. For example, you can have a million subscribers of, on YouTube and you can have thousands of people becoming Muslim every month. And all of that is lost with regards to the spiritual reward, the divine reward, because you did it for fame. You did it for people to say that you're, you're this great person. Brothers and sisters and friends, do not lose the reward of the noble action of giving da'wah, of sharing Islam. Because your heart is in the wrong place Another consequence of not having a class Is that it is meaningless These actions are meaningless They're baseless deeds Ibn Umar reported an, That the messenger of Allah وسلم, said One who fasts Might only acquire hunger and thirst From his fasting One who stands for prayer Might only acquire fatigue from his prayer In other words Your fasting is baseless and meaningless and your night prayer is baseless and meaningless because your heart was not in it. You didn't have ikhlas. You didn't have the sincere intention of singling out and directing this act of worship for Allah alone. Don't make your actions meaningless and baseless because your heart is in the wrong place. Another consequence of not having ikhlas is divine alienation. Abu Aliya, Abu Al Aliya reported that the companions of Muhammad, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, said to him, "Do not do a good deed for anyone besides Allah, uh, besides Allah, for Allah will leave you in charge of the one for whom you did it. In other words, Allah will leave you by virtue of us doing this act of worship for other than Allah. It's we, it's as if we close the door to Allah's mercy and protection." We have divine, we have alienated ourselves from the divine just because where our hearts lie, where our hearts are directed. If they're directed towards the people, then we will lose Allah. If, we're, if our hearts are directed towards Allah, then we gain Allah's special mercy and love, and also we'll gain the love of the people as well. So these are the consequences of not having ikhlas. So now we're ready to talk about what. Insincerity is now So we've understood what ikhlas is What the sincere intention is we underst We've understood what the consequences of having ikhlas are And what the consequences of not having ikhlas are And now we can start talking about Okay, well, what is not having ikhlas? What is insincerity? Which is also known in the English language as ostentation 
And there are two main areas of ostentation or showing off in the Islamic spiritual tradition. And this is mentioned in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and in the classical scholars. And this is Riya and Suma'a. Okay, and we're going to unpack these concepts right now. And it's important we understand what insincerity is, what Riya is and what Suma'a is. Why? Because it would allow us to now be able to make distinctions in our hearts in terms of where I, where is it that we are insincere in or of what, of what action we are insincere uh, concerning, what actions are we are insincere about. And making those distinctions are going to be very powerful, brothers and sisters, because we'll be able to take ourselves to account and actually traverse a path to remove riya, to remove ostentation, and to remove sum'ah. Okay, and we're going to discuss what these are. Okay, so what is riya? Riya is to do an action, an act of worship, so that people see these actions in order to win their praise and admiration, or to gain position and status amongst them, or to gain some kind of worldly benefit. Let me repeat. So this form of ostentation, this form of showing off, Riya is to do an act of worship so that people see them in order to win their praise, their admiration, to gain some position, to gain status amongst them, or and to obtain some worldly benefit. And we see this concept in the Quran and the Sunnah. For example, in chapter 107 verses 4 to 7, Allah says in the Quran, So woe to those who pray. But who are heedless of their prayer, those who make show of their deeds and withhold simple assistance. Also, Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al Baqarah, verse 264, the second chapter O oh, you who have believed, do not invalidate your charities with reminders of it or injury, as does one who spends his wealth only to be seen by the people and does not believe in Allah in the last day. His example is like that of a large, smooth stone. Upon which is dust and is hit by a downpour that leaves it bare. They are unable to keep anything of what they have earned. And Allah does not guide the disbelieving people. Also the Prophet wasallam said in a hadith narrated by Ibn Majah. Shall I not inform you about something which I fear more for you than the Dajjal? We said, the companion said, of course, O Messenger of Allah. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The hidden shirk, the hidden associationism, the hidden associating partners with Allah. A man stands for prayer and beautifies his prayer for those who are watching him. Subhanallah. Also in a hadith narrated by Musad Ahmed, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Verily, my greater fear for you is the lesser idolatry. They said, what is the lesser idolatry, O Messenger of Allah? The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is ostentation, riya. Allah Almighty will say to them on the day of resurrection, when people are being recompensed for their deeds, go to those for whom you made a show in the world and look, do you find any reward with them? SubhanAllah. And this is why brothers and sisters and friends, we must learn the supplication to protect ourselves from riya, from ostentation. And this supplication can be found in Musnad Ahmed, where we say, and, and the Prophet said, Say, O oh Allah, we seek refuge in you from associating partners with you while we are aware of it, and we seek forgiveness from you for that which we are unaware of. So this is riya. This is a, a form of insincerity, a form of ostentation. And this is showing off your deeds for people to praise you. So you seek the admiration. You have some kind of worldly benefit that you that your state is elevated in their eyes. So you're showing off your good deeds so they can see it. The other form of ostentation is suma'a. Now what is suma'a? Now similar to riya is suma'a. But this form of shirk, this form of associating partners with Allah is via the senses of Hearing is by the sense of hearing rather than sight. Okay, so they you want people to hear about your good deeds, yeah. And interestingly, the hadith narrated by Bukhari, authentic hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "He commits sumaa. Allah will do that with him, and he who commits riya, Allah will do that with him." 
And so what is the manifestation of sum'ah, this form of ostentation? Basically, number one, a person does an action with the intention that people hear that he or she hears, about, uh, uh, hears other people talk about it. So I do an act of worship, say giving da'wah, and I'm doing this act of worship, giving da'wah, sharing a song with people with the intention that I hear others talk about it. So I want people to hear about it. And I want to hear that people are talking about it, okay? Another manifestation of this form of ostentation and showing off is that a person relates his or her actions with the intention that others get to hear of it. So you mention the great work that you're doing, right? And maybe you present the great work that you're doing with the intention that people hear about it. And they will praise you and so on and so forth. And this is another form of ostentation that we have to be aware of. And it could be the case that the origin of the action was sincere. So say, for example, you're someone who recites Quran for an hour and a half at Fajr time, after the morning prayer. And that you're someone who at least does three times a week, you do Qiyam layl you stay, you stand in the night prayer. No one knows about this except you and Allah. And your original intention is that you did it for the sake of Allah. However, over time, as you talk to people and get to know more people, you start to mention it. And you're mentioning it with the intention that people hear about it. And therefore they will praise you as a result. Or they would you know, think great about you. Or the, the, your status would be increased in their eyes. So Suma'a can also be a form of ostentation that the origination of the action, of the act of worship. The origin of it was that you had sincerity. But after a year or a week or a month or whatever the case may be. You start to talk about it or you start to present it in a way that other people can hear about it. And that you... You, you now know that they start to uh, praise you in some way by virtue of these deeds. And concerning Riya and Sum'ah, the Prophet ﷺ said, He who lets the people hear of his good deeds intentionally to win their praise, Allah will let the people know of his real intention on the day of resurrection. And he who does good things in public to show off and win the praise of people, Allah would disclose his real intention and humiliate him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from these forms of ostentation, brothers and sisters. So what did the early generation say about this? About this, The pious predecessors, the salaf, right? And there are so many statements, and obviously we can't make this too long of a video, but let's focus on some of the statements that we have captured. Al-Hasan al-Basri, radiallahu anhu. May Allah be pleased with him, or may Allah have mercy on him. Said about the companions, may Allah be pleased with them all. One of them would have memorized the Quran and his neighbor would not be aware of that. One of them would have amassed much knowledge, but people would not know of that. One of them would perform lengthy prayers in his house and the guests he would have would not know of that. I met a people who if they were able to do any action on the face of the earth in private, they would never do it in public. Allahu Akbar. Also, the wife of Hassan ibn Abi Sinan said, Hassan would come and like tricking, to, uh, tricking a child to sleep. Enter with me into bed until he knows that I had slept. He would sneak out and stand in prayer. I said to him, Oh, Abba Abdullah, how much are you going to torture yourself? Have compassion on yourself. He replied, Be quiet and woe to you. It may be soon that I lay down and I do, go, do not get up from that for an extent of time. Now this is obviously is quite moving and emotional. Also the famous scholar Al-Mawardi, he wrote the book Ahkam Al-Sultaniya and he authored works on fiqh, on jurisprudence, on tafsir, on exegesis and other fields. And none of this was known during his time. Now, he wrote them, he developed these works in a place that no one knew of. So when his death came near, he told someone he trusted that he has his book, that he, that he has books authored in a certain place and that he did not publicize them because he did not feel that he had sincere intention. He instructed that the person, that once he sees that he's about to die, if he squeezes his hand, then no, it has not been accepted of him and to take the works at night and dump them. On the other hand, if he does not squeeze his hand, 
then know they have been accepted and that he has achieved what he has hoped from Allah. The man said, when his death approached, I put my hand in his hand and when he opened his hand and did not squeeze mine, so I knew that it was a sign of acceptance and I published, published his works after that. So this is his sincerity. So he was not only aware of the concept of riya, but suma'ah. Basically, he didn't want people to hear about it. Or he didn't want to hear that people heard about it. So his intention would change. That he would want people to know that he's the author of these great works. Such were the pious predecessors. Such were our scholars. Such were our pious masters. The people that we need to emulate. So now we can move on the indicators of sincerity and insincerity. There are many and we could mention a few just for you to start to get the idea of what are the signs of insincerity, what are the signs of sincerity and you could use these as criteria if you like to take yourself to account and maybe you could have a close network of friends and a group of people that could also, sorry, hold you to account, that, that could hold you to account inshallah, okay? So what are the indicators of sincerity? Number one, your private actions are more than your public actions, especially with regards to acts of worship. That you dislike being famous or known. That you have intense desire to work for the sake of Allah. That you are being proactive and you're seeking reward. That you have patience, forbearance and you don't complain. That you strive to do deeds in secret. That you perfect your deeds in secret. That you have an Allah-centric and Akhirah-centric mindset with regards to your vision and your decision making, that you're not petty, that you're not always desiring to defend yourself. These are indicators of sincerity. And for me, the greatest indicator of sincerity is this, is always asking the question, what is closer to the pleasure of Allah? Forget, forget just the halal or the haram. What is closer to the pleasure of Allah? Because something could be halal, but it's not the best thing to do. There's one thing that could be halal, permitted, and it's not the best thing to do. There could be another action that is permitted, but it's the best thing to do. It's even closer to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you ask yourself that question, especially in a da'wah context, many of our pettiness, many of our arguments, many of this ego, many of this kind of childish behavior is going to stop because you have Allah in mind. You have an Allah-centric and Akhirah-centric mindset by asking the right question. What does Allah want from me in this specific context? What is closer to to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what are the indicators of not having ikhlas, of insincerity? Wanting to be known. Seeking people's praise. Striving to show one's deeds. Hardly any or no hidden deeds. Concentrating on perfecting deeds in public only. And these are indicators of insincerity. Another indicator of insincerity is that you do not seek what is more pleasurable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't ask the question, what does Allah want from me in this particular particular context? What is more pleasing to Allah in this particular context? So finally, brothers and sisters and friends, how do we develop sincerity? How do we develop ikhlas? Now, just to remind you of the importance of this topic, the famous scholar Sufyan al thawri may Allah have mercy upon him, said, I have never treated something within myself that I have found to be the most difficult other than my intention, it keeps changing on me. SubhanAllah. And here are a list of things to do. Take this very seriously. Brothers and sisters and friends, Wallahi, take this seriously and try to implement this. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He doesn't test me with these words, that I implement this as well. First and foremost, seek help from Allah. Make dua to Allah that He makes you sincere. Make dua in sajda, in prostration. As you know, the Prophet ﷺ said that you are closest to your Lord. You are closest to your Lord when you're in the state of prostration. So supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask Him, Oh Allah, make me sincere. Make me sincere. Make me have ikhlas. Because at the end of the day, we are all ultimately dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are ultimately and fundamentally dependent on him. Everything happens because of his irada and qudra. Everything happens because of his will and power, brothers and sisters. So we need to make dua, supplicate to him. Supplicate to Allah. Because you are solely dependent on him. Allah is as-samad. He is the self-sufficient. 
He is the independent. Everything depends on him. He is al ghani He is the rich, the free of any need. Depend on Allah. Make dua to him. Say, oh Allah, make me sincere. The other thing we need to do is do an action every day apart from the obligatory actions that no one knows about apart from you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, take this seriously. Do an action every day apart from the obligatory actions like the five daily prayers that no one knows about, not even your wife, your partner, your husband, whatever. No one knows about apart from you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make sure no one knows. Do this every day and this helps you develop ikhlas. The other thing to think about and reflect upon is death. Every soul is going to taste death, Allah says in the Quran. Think about death. It is the destroyer of pleasures. This is, this is the teaching of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Al-Ghazali, the 11th century theologian and polymath, he actually mentioned something very similar in his Ihya, in his revival of the religious, religious sciences when he talked about death. And he said that there is so many benefits in reflecting on death. Even the Stoic philosophers talk about thinking about death. Think about death. Why? Because it's going to remind you of the Akhirah, the true life, the eternal life. Because what we do now, the seeds that we plant here, they may be fruits in the Akhirah or they may just be weeds. So think about the weight of our deeds. And the weight of our deeds is contingent, dependent upon our ikhlas. Brothers and sisters, there's going to come a time when we're not going to be remembered or known. We're going to be forgotten. There's going to be a time where we're going to pass away. And the most important thing that's going to count is not deeds, but sincere deeds. So brothers and sisters, it's so important to reflect upon death because it facilitates that realization. Also, remind yourself about the consequences of having ikhlas as we mentioned. And warn yourself about the consequences of not having ikhlas, not having sincerity as we mentioned. Another thing to do is to strive to increase your private deeds and to perfect your private deeds. Another thing to do, and this is very important, it's the power of questioning, is always pause and reflect. Don't become mechanical. When you're doing a YouTube channel or a video or giving a lecture or giving dawah, just stop for a moment and just take a conscious snapshot of yourself and pause and reflect and say, why am I doing this? For whom am I doing this? Think about this. Think about the quality of the action that you're going to do and start to reflect and purify your intention. And always ask, and we've mentioned this before, what is more pleasing to Allah in this particular moment and context? The minute you just ask that question, Everything is going to revolve around it. Everything would basically be at service to that question. And even if you're not sincere, by virtue of asking that question, it's going to allow you to become as sincere as, poss as possible. It's going to optimize your sincerity. Think about what's more pleasing to Allah, that I react to this person, that I just defend myself because it's all about me, or I just pause and reflect and I forgive and overlook and I transcend this and I think about the bigger picture, the greater maslaha, the greater benefit. It's such an important question, brothers and sisters, wallahi. What does Allah want from me? What's closer to the pleasure of Allah in this particular context? Also, remember, ikhlas is not in the liver or the brain, it's in the heart. And the heart, the qalb, qalaba, it wavers, the taqallub, it, it, it changes, it wavers. And therefore, we need to focus on the heart. And the heart has fitten shahawat and shubuhat, destructive doubts, and blameworthy desires. And we need to be aware of these things. And the heart also has diseases. The four major spiritual diseases are Riyah, which we just mentioned, ostentation, Kibr, arrogance, Ujub, self amazement, and Hasad, blameworthy jealousy. And all the other spiritual diseases that emanate from these. So it's very important that we focus on our heart because if our heart is diseased, then we're, we're less likely to have ikhlas. So we need to have a heart that is sound. How do you develop a sound heart? Do the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything has a polish and the, and the polish of the heart is the dhikr is the remembrance of Allah. Do the afkar in the morning and the evening, the remembrances in the morning and the evening. Make dua to Allah as we mentioned. Do tahajjud. Pray in the last third of the night. Ask for Allah's mercy in the last third of the night. Recite the Quran. It's a shifa. It's a purification. Even more important in my view is do tadabbur of the Qur'an. Understand the guidance of the Qur'an. Ponder over the Qur'an. Allah says in the Qur'an, do they not ponder over the Qur'an or the locks on their hearts? So this could mean 
that the more you ponder, the more your heart becomes unlocked to receive the guidance and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ponder over the Quran. It's going to help your heart. So these are the things that we need to do in order to soften our heart, have a spiritually strong heart, and therefore we're more likely to have ikhlas. And fundamentally, brothers and sisters, which is connected to this, have good company. You're going to be the product of the people around you. This is well known in the Quran and the Sunnah. And you could do a tadabbur over the chapter in the Quran, chapter 18, when Allah mentions the dog and the pious people who were saved. They were saved and they were put into the cave. And the dog was also placed in the cave. Now, Ibn Kathir, one of the classical commentators of the Quran, actually talks about this. You know, why is the dog even mentioned? Why is the dog even mentioned? It's almost irrelevant to the story from a kind of prime facey point of view. But when you scratch the surface, you see the depth here. And what is the lesson? Ibn Kathir, Ibn Kathir basically says that if Allah saved a kind of relatively lowly animal compared to us, saved the dog because it happened to be with the pious people, then in, and it happened to be a companion to the pious people, then imagine what Allah would do to us as believers if we happen to have righteous companions. Allahu Akbar. Think about your environment, brothers and sisters. This is not only in line with the Quran and the Sunnah, but also in line with social psychology, the development of the social norms, social influence. This is well known in this field. And this is why you have to take very seriously your environment and your companionship. Another thing to do is to reflect on stories of ikhlas. Read the books of the companions, the life of the companions, the life of the pious predecessors, the life of the Salaf, the life of the classical pious scholars. And look at, look at what they achieved and how they achieved it. And, and, and trying to understand why they achieved what they achieved. Take an nabawi for example. He wrote the, he, he compiled the Arba'in, the Futi Hadith, the Ahadith. But many scholars compiled Futi Ahadith. But why is an nabawi so well known? The scholar says because he had ikhlas. It was accepted from him. And there are many beautiful stories from the Salaf and the early generation and the classical scholars that when we reflect upon them, it just encourages us to continue this path so we could become people of ikhlas, we could become mukhlis, we could become sincere people. Another thing to take seriously is never be complacent. Always remind yourself, hold yourself to account. Think about what we said earlier about the indicators of sincerity, the indicators of insincerity. Have good people around you to hold you to account as well. Do that every day. Put it into your diaries. Put it into your calendar, into your notes. Think about, I need to hold myself to account concerning my ikhlas. Don't be complacent. Another thing to do is to, to do istighfar. Repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this is important from the point of view that if you did deeds, acts of worship, not for the sake of Allah, if you do tawbah, if you return to Allah and you do istighfar, you ask Allah's forgiveness. Allah is so merciful. As he mentions in the Quran, that the deeds that you did, not for his sake, which are evil deeds, technically, right? Those deeds will become good deeds. So there is always hope. If you spent a whole decade, a whole decade of doing da'wah, sharing Islam, which is an act of worship just for praise and just for fame, but then you had this spiritual awakening and then you turn back to Allah, you do tawbah, you do istighfar, then inshallah Allah will turn those 10 years into good deeds. Such is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another thing to do is this, brothers and sisters and friends, don't fall for the trick of shaitan. Shaitan will whisper and say, ah, oh, you don't have 100% pure intention, what's the point? Don't fall for this trap. The scholars say this is a trick of shaitan. Still do the action. Even if there is no ikhlas, still do the action because the only way to develop sincerity, brothers and sisters, is through the action itself. So do not give up the action. So brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, 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 all perfect praise and gratitude belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have completed the first video. I think it's one of the most important topics we have to emphasize and unpack. I apologize for the length, but I think it was worth it. It's something that we have to unpack further even more. It's something that we have to emphasize again and again and again because it is a grave matter, brothers and sisters. This is about our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the greatest thing that we have is our relationship. The greatest thing that we have is our iman. Think about what Allah says, I think it's in chapter 49 verse 7 or 49, chapter 49 verse 17 when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about those people who think that 
Iman, faith was a favor to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And Allah says, say to them Iman, faith is a favor to you It's a favor Iman, brothers and sisters Faith, having conviction in Allah and His Messenger Having conviction in this, in this deen In the way of Abraham In this pure monotheism this conviction, brothers and sisters and friends, is the greatest priceless gift we can ever have. The greatest gift. Think about it. Now, I don't like postulating these thought experiments, but I'm doing it just to bring this point home. If you had to choose a life of suffering, but you had faith, iman, and a life of well-being, and you had no iman, what would you choose? It would be very difficult, but what would you choose? You would choose the life with Iman because you understand the priceless nature of this gift. Do not take this gift for granted. And the fact and the con and the understanding of ikhlas, whether we have ikhlas or not, is actually an indicator whether we take this gift seriously or not. Brothers and sisters, take this very seriously. Our, our relation with Allah, our Iman is a greatest gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can only utilize this gift properly if we have ikhlas in our acts of worship. And our akhirah, our eternal abode, is actually based on what's in our heart. Are we doing this deed because we love Allah? He is worthy of this act of worship. Is it because we want His divine reward? Are we doing it because we remove ourselves from the punishment? Are we doing it for all of these reasons? If that's the case, then we're on the right path. If we're doing it for fame, for people to hear about it, or to show off those deeds, or doing it for likes, for comments, and so on and so forth, then we're in a very, very dangerous position. And that's why my advice is, is to take seriously the points that I've just mentioned on how to de develop sincerity, to remind ourselves of the consequences of not having ikhlas, to remind ourselves of the consequences of having ikhlas, and to reflect on the pious stories of sincerity. And to reflect on the Quran and the Sunnah with regards to this topic. So brothers and sisters, anything that I've said that was wrong or inaccurate has come from my ego and shaitan. Anything that is good has come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah bless you. Jazakallah for the opportunity. And I really pray to Allah that this has been a form of inspiration. That it has touched, touched you. It's moved you and inspired you. So you could traverse the path. You could walk the path of ikhlas. So you could become a mukhlis. And I pray to Allah that Allah makes me a mukhlis, He makes all of you people of ikhlas, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes us all to paradise together. Eternal bliss. May Allah bless every single one of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.